Okay. Be right there. Excuse me. File. All right. And no objections, right? No objections. Right. That's why I'm going to adjourn. Okay. And for the benefit of the jury, I'm going to I'm going to move for the admission of defendants B. That's the diagram of the floor plan of the house. Um, no objection. And that's that's admitted. We're outside the evidence. Right. Those are the two things. And, Ron, I still think we need to take up that comparative fault work. We do, but very quickly, there's one jury instruction that's sideways, just yes. like matters, and the fact that, that there are no facts to support it, to it, no witnesses rendering extra opinion. Yeah, well, no, I agree, you can pull it. I agree. You didn't give any opinion testimony. Thank you. Okay. Put it in there. Okay. All right, so these are the final instructions that we got. Yes, sir. Then there is the last issue of the, uh, the, the statement that whether there's a comparative fault instruction. Both Mr. Barber and I came up with the same two cases. I want. Well, you said you didn't find the judge. I would, and I may I approach with a copy of the. Do you have the instruction or the, I have the verdict form? I have a proposed verdict form. I have is it one here. No, that's the one that Bob sent. Okay. He should have all three of ours. The one for plaintiff. I have a comparative verdict form for plaintiff that's comparative because you have a comparative that says less than 50, so I have one that's more than 50. Um, our position, Judge, based on Indiana case law, is there is no comparative fault verdict form. There's a case on point. What does it say? It says basically that, and it's the case, if I can just give you a copy real quick, so you can, um, it's Becker versus Fisher. And it was an intentional act. A plaintiff brought a suit against the defendant for battery and confinement. Uh, he went to jury. The uh, uh, plaintiff uh, filed. It was a cross appeal. One of the issues on appeal was whether or not the comparative fault act and personal fault was applicable. And the court there said that the comparative fault act does not affect a defendant's liability, but operates to decrease the amount of damages a plaintiff recovers if he has not appropriately mitigated his damage. It said that the statute has been interpreted to allow a reduction of an award for an intentional tort of battery only when the plaintiff has failed to mitigate damages. So the comparative fault, and it's an intentional act, not a negligence issue. Okay. Which is what we believe. So there, there is no fault that issue. Either he committed the intentional tort and they find for the plaintiff, or he did not and they find for the defendant. The only other case on the point is Dallas versus Becker, but that had to do with joint and several liabilities. Okay. What if, what if uh, an intentional tort, the evidence shows that the alleged intentional tort but turned out to be negligence? There, we, our position is that's not supported by the facts, Judge. They, 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 they'll either find that he committed a battery, or they'll find that he did not. Judge, if I can be heard on this, it, the only I, I, I agree that that Becker states the proposition, generally speaking, what David was talking about. But what we have here now in this case is testimony of two different incidents. There's fight part A and fight part B, so that's not on point there. And I think a jury can conclude, because this is going to be essentially a credibility issue on the trial, is number one, how the first fight started, and number two, whether or not the second round two, how that was an issue, because there was testimony on both sides about we were consistent that the fight at one point, they broke apart, and then it resumed. So not only do we have two different issues here, now there's two separate matters that the, the jury needs to consider, and it is conceivable that in asking for one total sum of damages, the jury has to take into account basically two different incidents in this point. Granted, if they have, they are free to find for Mr. Malangoni in the aggregate, they are free to find for Mr. Jackson in the aggregate, either by failure, insufficiency of evidence or legal justification, i.e. the self-defense. But what we have here now is going to be two different issues, and it's in the second round of fight, uh, of the fight where the testimony was, at least in part in this trial, was that Mr. Malangoni then charged Mr. Jackson. That's when they went to the ground. That's when he suffered one of his injuries, which is the laceration of the head by hitting his head on the weight plate. 
So I think factually speaking that this can go to the jury under these circumstances because it's not a straight single one interrupted in the on top. And the reason I, I'm sorry, the reason I cited to Dallas is because it was a joint and several liability issue where that was allowed. Now, granted, in that case, it was whether it was more than one defendant. It's not on point, just kind of like Becker isn't precisely on point. But it, in the citation for Dallas, I believe it was two joint and several liability question. But that's something where the, the jury had to determine, well, at which point in the fight, what damage was going to be caused by who. And I think we have actually something very similar here. Judge, we don't have something very similar. This two-fight theory is Mr. Barbas' theory, but it's a fight. You either committed an intentional tort or you engaged in self-defense after being attacked. Now, fights can, you know, don't get broken up nice and neatly into sections unless there's some sort of reasonable breaking time. Now, with respect to the proposition that Mr. Barbas decided, the only time the courts have struggled, in fact, Becker was one, and there's, the, the, the literature is complete with discussions on struggles with the strict liability for an intentional tort and the comparative fault of a negligent party, a co-defendant. Ramatala v. Santelli, the case that went to the Supreme Court from the death down at the hotel in Indianapolis, that was a classic case. Becker is precisely on point. There's no evidence of mitigation of damages. He, Mr. Jackson, either committed the intentional tort or it was excused by virtue of self-defense. And it's just that simple. And inviting the jury to allocate fault in Jackson Elwood is a case that is not applicable in an intentional tort nor supported by the fact. The instruction vis-a-vis the verdict form is that is whether there was an intentional tort and whether there was a defense. And it's not covered by any other applicable instruction. That is, no other verdict form that more accurately states the law. I have a copy of the decision if Your Honor wants to take a moment. Let me see that. And it begins on the second column on page two, sir. Have you seen this case, Mr. Barton? Have you read it? And it's in this column, the second column. What about a mutual combat situation? Could the jury find that it's a mutual combative situation? Then what? There's no evidence that he either did or did not. That's covered in the battery instructions. Whether or not what he did was covered by a justification or excuse. Hang on a second. This is the one issue that the way that you're stating it is generally speaking. But you said there's only two possibilities. There's not two possibilities. There either was an intentional tort or it was self-defense. The third option is there was no liability whatsoever without even self-defense being offered. The jury believes that Mr. Malangoni initiated the physical. This second paragraph on the second column conclusively answers this discussion. Jury instructions sent out in Indiana Code 3451-27, Comparative Fault Act, which Becker tendered to the trial court, instructs the jury to assign percentages of liability. However, under Coffman and Kocher, a plaintiff in an intentional tort case may not be assigned a percentage of liability. Therefore, the instruction is irrelevant to intentional tort cases. Now, in a mutual combat situation, that would be more appropriate if there had been a counterclaim for battery. There was not. The defendant may not be assigned. What about the plaintiff? This says the plaintiff may not be assigned liability. So I get back to my fundamental position. Either he committed an intentional tort and they find for the plaintiff, or he engaged in self-defense, in which case they find for Mr. Vargas. But I think this answers the question. There's no counterclaim for battery by Mr. Malangoni. None of that. And a comparative verdict form actually would tend to confuse the jury on the issue of law. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Barton. This matter will be taken under advisement. This position will be issued.
I know we're so ingrained with the comparative fault verdict form. It becomes part of the DNA. No, it's not that. It's just that it seems like there's elements of negligence involved in this whole entire matter, too. We haven't planned that. I mean, he's there. What can the jury find? The issues raised in our pleadings in the pretrial were just whether or not Mr. Jackson committed an intentional act. And the fact that that's the only thing that they're raising does not mean that the evidence that comes out in trial does not create other issues. For example, if Mr. Malinconi had accused Mr. Jackson of only battery and then goes in there and would have testified, and I think that there is going to be at least some room for negligence, that his testimony in some way deviates or adds into the conversation that's happened of different facts or different situations that could be supported by these other theories, then that becomes fair game. And that's why I think that when you have a situation, especially when we have a start and a stop that has been testified to in my memory, certainly by both parties, they agree that there was an initial contact, there was a choke, there was a brief break, and then the question is, did Mr. Jackson go after Mr. Malinconi or did Mr. Malinconi then charge and re-engage Mr. Jackson? That's going to be for the jury to decide. So when we have all this, we also have a history of the emails and the prior phone conversation with the two of them. I believe that there could be a finding potentially that there was some negligent acts there. If I may, and I promise to shut up, two points. One, Head Note 6, Becker answers the question on whether or not fault can be allocated, period. Second point, with respect to this suggestion that there may be elements of negligence, it's actually covered by the instruction on battery, I believe, or the longer one where it says that somebody did not instigate. I'd have to see the actual final instructions. But there are several elements on the battery and, I believe, self-defense where it talks about whether or not Mr. Malinconi had instigated any action as a defense to the battery allegation. But I think that Becker answers the question. Judge Dan, I'm not challenging Becker. I just want to be clear for the record. I understand what Becker said. All right. But I just think that factually we may have a difference. Well, it's a close one. I mean, to some degree, I mean, the evidence I heard, you know, he was invited on, he was in there. Well, all right. I don't know how much comparative fault instruction will confuse the jury between the negligence and the intentional tort. That may be a problem. If they start looking at this case like a negligence case, it might be worse. So, all right. We'll go with the, where are the verdict forms that you do propose without the comparative fault? Mr. Vargas submitted an outright verdict form with the jury fund. Judge, can we see if these are the two that they want to go back for? We're not going to. Little jury is tried in favor of plaintiff Justin Malinconi against defendant Craig Jackson to cite plaintiff's damages, excluding punitive damages. That would be ours that we had submitted without the comparative issues. Okay. And I think Mr. Vargas submitted one with a second with the portion. Yeah, I submitted one. The way the jury decided that defendant Craig Jackson was not at fault and therefore decided in favor of defendant Craig Jackson against plaintiff Justin Malinconi. That's a straight defense one. And then with the jury, this is all the same in the first one, except for the punitive damage. Entitled to receive the punitive damages. Please raise your own space provided if you decide the plaintiff is not entitled to punitive damages. These two? Yes, sir. Judge, I guess that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. You don't show my punitive damage language. It's not a question. I'm a fan of it, but no, those are fine. These are fine? Those are fine. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And for purposes of the record, Judge, it's for any adverse action by a party. And then this is out, Judge? The Becker decision is cited at 852 Monday, February 6th. That's a confirmed call. Thank you. Well, I mean, here we are back to this one here. I mean, what was that other one? That's got to be the defendant's where it says fault. Now, we have this one here. Will the jury find percentage of the fault? I mean, if this is a mutual, I mean, couldn't the jury find that this is a mutual combat kind of thing? They certainly can. I don't believe that that's a deviation from Becker, Your Honor. You know, they might find one guy started it and the other guy accelerated it. That's adequately covered in the instructions. That can also be addressed in the mitigation of damages argument. But Becker, I mean, it's an intentional tort case. There's no allegations of negligence by the plaintiff. And the only defense the defendant has raised is that he engaged in self-defense, which is an absolute defense. It's the only defense I have to raise. It's not going to mean it's the only defense I'm limited to. It's the only one I need to affirmatively raise. Well, now that we're arguing jury instructions, I'd argue the issue is waived if it wasn't raised in the plea. The only issue that the jury has been instructed on is battery and self-defense. To start inviting them to engage in comparative fault, mutual combat, which would require further definitions and instructions as to what mutual combat is. Well, I think you need one of those. I agree. I think you need one of those mutual combat ones. Not just a sufficiency issue on the plaintiff's claims. That's all it is. You don't have to have a, again, I don't have to ever plead. Where's my book? I don't have to plead. On the shovel, there's only the enumerated affirmative defenses. But, you know, again, it's going to be what it is. I mean, I really think the jury can conclude that. If they think that. It talks about mutual combat. It talks about whether Mr. Malangoni engaged or instigated it as one of the elements. All right. That's what we're going to find out. Easy battery, right? Yes, sir. Give me your time. I got to do the kitchen project. And then the elements that he listed for self-defense. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, okay. Well, look here. It's covered in. Has willingly entered into combat with another person or is the dish or is the initial aggressor unless she withdraws from the encounter and communicates to the other person intent to withdraw. And the other person nevertheless continues or threatens to continue the unlawful action. Do we have that one in the instruction? That's in the self-defense pattern. Yeah. That's the mutual combat one. Yes, that's covered in their self-defense. So that's that's an element for the jury to consider 
in deciding whether or not to engage in self-defense. And Mr. Vargas is free to argue that. But we still don't get around that. This is an intentional court case. So even if it's mutual combat, it's self-defense? Well, yeah, it can be. Well, mutual, if it's willing mutual combat, it's not supposed to be. Meaning, Dave and I can't. In other words, he backs off. We're going to go outside and settle this. One guy backs off, and then the other guy keeps attacking. This is the only reason I say factually we're going to have the same factual record is going to be because we have testimony from both sides that there was an initial part of this fight, there was a break, and I think then there was a resumption. And the jury can believe, for example, A, Mr. Malangoni initiated both. B, that Mr. Jackson initiated and was the initial aggressor on both. Or C, they can find that one started round one and one started round two, and that's where we have the potential split. That's why I offer the comparative point. We have an alleged negligence. That's still intentional. It is an intentional act case, and Becker answers the question. There's no evidence of mitigation. They were free and have had proper evidence on their self-defense allegation, and they can argue that that is an element in support of their self-defense allegation. It's a warrant for comparative fault finding. He either committed an intentional act or was excused by self-defense. Well, yeah. And in fairness to the court, the courts have struggled with this when you have co-defendants. This is not an easy issue. I understand that. Well, it's an all-or-nothing proposition. For either side. For either side. Yeah. As is contributory negligence, but they're still stuck with it. I don't like it as a plan. Yeah, because of the allegations of intentional tort, and that's all that came out. I don't, I mean, there's no negligence alleged there. So I'm like, that's what we have to go with. As much as I don't care for the state of it, I understand that. And I just want to make sure I point it out just so I can preserve my record that the factual difference in this case. Yeah, there's a factual difference, but they're both, even in that one, isn't that an intentional? Yeah, and again, Judge, I'm not sitting here, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that there is wrong, although I may not like it. I understand what Becker says, and it's clear what he says, but what I don't like is because I don't think it's on account of the facts that have come out in this case. Right. That was my reasoning. But the underlying issue is still whether he started the second fight that's intentional. Well, I have to admit that, yeah. It's not a negligent. Those would both be intentional acts depending on who they find was an intentional act. Okay. All right, then that's what we'll go with. We'll go with those two. And I guess we have a set now. Is that it? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, Paul, let's get them. Is that the order, Judge, that we want? What order? The agreed ones? Yeah, these. That's the order? Yeah, make a copy. No, let me get them here. I'll put these in order. We'll take a break and I'll get these in order, make a copy, make sure we got them off, and bring the jury out. Okay? All right. Thank you.